Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are now or if you're watching the recording. Uh, we will give you, you a couple of minutes to let more people to, to register and we will start um, in two minutes. Thank you very much. Please leave your comments on the chat. Uh, tell us from where you're connecting, where are you? Uh, where are you right now? Uh, we welcome everyone from Chile, South America. I hope everyone uh, enjoy the, the webinar that we have prepared for today. Uh, we have people registered for every part of the world. Italy, of course, Spain, Chile, Argentina, France, Bolivia, UK, Brazil. Wow, it's amazing, it's amazing. Thank you very much for signing up. We hope you like uh, today's session. Wow, from Ecuador, United Kingdom, many different places around the, the world. Welcome everyone to this uh, free webinar, uh, Success Strategies for Freelance Translators. We expect everyone can take something from this session and deploy it and start using it as soon as as you learn it in your current work okay we will start in a couple of seconds hello from germany look wow it's amazing thanks to technology we can get uh, everywhere currently i think that this is one of the positive things uh, about pandemics very well Let's start. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, my name is Renato Mendez. I am the director of Verba Volant, uh, a language service provider based uh, in Chile. We are MemoQ partner uh, and we also started developing this training program for colleagues around the world in topics that we know you uh, want to learn more about it. I will give you at the beginning some general information so you can uh, enjoy the, the session. Uh, so uh, I will um, list a, a couple of things so you can enjoy it. Uh, these sessions will last one hour and we will left at the end sometimes to um, answer some questions that you may have. All questions have to be asked uh, using the chat, please, or you can raise your hand if you want to talk. We will be marking your questions, ask questions, so if they disappear from the chat is because they are on our registration as a question and we will uh, let it from to, to the end of the sessions, of course. Uh, of course, also use the chat only for the training related topics. Uh, there's a lot of people sign up for this session and following the chat could be a little bit hard. So let's keep it uh, just related to the question that you may have. Also, if you have uh, problems uh, with the video or with the audio, uh, you will have to press the F5 um, button in your computer if you're using your, your desk computer or using the reconnect button that you can see at the upper part of your device if you're using a mobile device. Um, also, uh, we recommend you to close uh, other application that may be using uh, memory, uh, your, your computer memory or the bandwidth. So this Please keep in mind all these things so you can uh, enjoy the, the session um, at the best. Uh, at the end of the webinar, you will receive an email from me, including the link to the recording and more information that could be useful for you. And just letting you know that uh, this recording will be available for 10 days so you can see it uh, whenever you want during this period of time. I don't want to take much time, so I will ask you to uh, follow us on social media so you can be um, aware of what we are doing and you can sign up for other activities that we are organizing this year uh, with uh, excellent presenters and colleagues that are very well known, some of them authors or of uh, books that we studied at, at university or that we are studying now to improve our professional, uh, our, our professional work. And 
I, I, I will leave you with Corinne McKay, today's instructor, today's presenter. We're very glad to have Corinna, uh, Corinne here. Uh, we're very glad that he, she accept, accepted to be here and to develop the program. Hello, Corinne, good morning. Hi there. Uh, Corinne, welcome to the session. Uh, I will leave you here with everyone. We have two, 250 people connected already. So Ooh. I will leave you to, to present yourself and to start the presentation. I'm pretty sure they want to hear you and not me. <laughs> I don't know about that. But yeah, most of all. Yeah, welcome. Ah, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Renato, for inviting me to do this. And um, I was just saying to Renato before we started that I really admire his um, entrepreneurial spirit and his commitment to the translation community worldwide for authoring these amazing um, sessions. So, oops. Hang on. There we go. Okay. So the reason that Quick Start is crossed out here is because when Renato and I were talking about the name of this uh, session, and don't worry, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about myself in a second, um, in case you wonder, like, who is this person who's been brought to talk to us about freelancing? But we thought about calling it Quick Start Strategies for Freelance Translators. And the reason I left that on there with Quick Start crossed out is because there is no such thing as a quick start strategy um, as a freelancer. I think the reality is that it's a lot of hard work. And if you guys are here, that shows that you um, understand that. So here's some logistics for today. Uh, as Renato said, the webinar will last about an hour. All of you are muted, but we could unmute you. Renato is going to watch the chat. Um, I'm running the slides, so it's a little hard for me to look at the chat. But um, if you have a question that needs to be answered immediately, he'll interrupt me. And also, I want you guys to tell me if I'm talking too fast. Um, I don't have much of an accent, I think, for an American. <laughs> but when I get excited about topics like freelance translation, sometimes I talk too fast. So if you need me to slow down, just tell me. And hopefully we'll have 10 or 15 minutes um, of question and answer at the end. And then if you guys enjoy the session today, Renato is running um, a four part um, paid version of this class. And let me tell you, it's really affordable. I think it's 88 US dollars, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right, 88 US dollars for four two hour sessions in the US. That would be kind of an unheard of. <laughs> deal. Renato really has a good heart to do that. So if you enjoy the session today, um, we're going to do a four part paid session on various topics that we'll tell you about at the end. But who am I? Why have I been brought to talk to you today? So uh, my name's Corinne McKay. Um, I live in Boulder, Colorado, which is uh, actually I'll show you. Um, the red state there is Colorado um, in the Rocky Mountains of the United States. Um, I've been a freelancer for about 18 years. Since 2002, I'm certified by the American Translators Association for French to English Translation. And then um, just to inspire you guys that you can take new career directions at any age, I'm 49 now. And in 2018, I passed the, color, the state of Colorado uh, court interpreting exam for French. And actually my adventure during the pandemic is that I'm a student in the master's in conference interpreting program at Glendon College in Toronto, Canada, except I do it from home, obviously, right now. Uh, I was the president of the American Translators Association from 2017 to 2019, so I'm the most recent past president of ATA. And I run a small company called Training for Translators that offers um, trainings like this uh, on a variety of business and translating topics. And then I wrote a book called How to Succeed as a Freelance Translator that some of you may be um, familiar with. So that's, um, that's me. That's Colorado. You already saw it. <laughs> what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about four different things. I wanted to include something for um, both beginners and people at the more advanced end of the spectrum. So we're going to talk about some basics of being a freelance translator. 
whether you want to work with agencies, direct clients, or both, and how to market to both of those, how to choose a specialization, and then some pitfalls and best practices. So first of all, I think for freelancers at any um, stage of their business, this is even important for me after 18 years of freelancing, I think the most important thing is that you are a business owner and thus you make business decisions. So one thing that makes me angry <laughs> is, I'm not an angry person, but one thing that makes me angry is when I hear translators who say, this client pressured me to lower my rates and I really didn't want to do it, but they're so nice. I felt bad saying no. Well, if you go to a business, if you need an accountant to do your taxes and you say, you know what? I'm such a nice person. Can't you give me a discount? They would laugh in your face, right? They would never do that. Um, your accountant or your web designer would not feel bad telling you, no, I'm not doing that. My price is my price. Um, and I think we need to do that too. And then another thing is you have to believe that it is possible to succeed. So an example that Renato and I were talking about when we were preparing um, this series is for those of you who live in Latin America and translate from English into Spanish or any language into Spanish, it is true that there is a lot of downward price pressure, especially from translation agencies in other countries, right? Um, translation agencies in the US or Canada or Europe um, who think like, we can probably get this person to work for less money than a translator who lives in our country. But <laughs> I also know several translators who do English to Spanish and live in Latin America who make like over a hundred thousand US dollars a year. I'm not saying that that's normal or average, but what I'm saying is you have to believe that it is possible in order to run a successful freelance business. And the reality, like I told you when Quick Start was crossed out, to be a freelancer, you have to work really, really hard over a very long period of time. And I have a little slide about that in a second. <laughs> um, but here's some basics for anybody who uh, is not really familiar with the translation and interpreting professions or industries. And I thought maybe there would be some of you here today that are just thinking about this, like you're in the idea stage of thinking, I speak another language, what could I do with it? The most important thing is, translators write and interpreters talk. So I'm not sure about in your guys' countries, but here in the US, one thing that um, radio and TV reporters say all the time is like, uh, President Xi Jinping speaking through a translator, Chancellor Angela Merkel speaking through a translator. And if you know that that's not correct, then you already know more. <laughs> <laughs> than a lot of reporters do because you can't speak through a translator. You can only speak through an interpreter. Um, most translators work only into their native language. That's not always true. Um, an example of that would be if you're in, let's say if you need a translation from, um, I don't know, Tagalog into English, really probably the translator is going to be a native Tagalog. That's the language they speak in the Philippines. Um, really the translator is probably going to be a native Tagalog speaker and proofread by a native English speaker. But in general, most translators only work into their native language. But for interpreters, that's really not so true. Because for example, when I go interpret in court, you have to interpret in both directions and they don't really want to hire two interpreters one for French to English and one for English to French. So one person does both. And interpreters tend to refer to their languages as A, B, and C. So for example, I'm English A, French B. So A is your native language. B is a language where you're not native, but you interpret from and into. And then C is a language that you only interpret from, never into. But those are the basics. Okay. 
so here's my slide about um, being willing to work really hard. So this picture is a woman named Lori Greiner, who if any of you are, I don't really watch much TV at all, but if any of you are into American TV shows, she's on a TV show called Shark Tank, which is where different entrepreneurs come and like pitch their businesses to investors. And the thing that she said is, entrepreneurs are willing to work 80 hours a week to avoid working 40 hours a week. Now, I've never worked 80 hours a week in my life. I'll tell you that. Um, but the, I think her point here is well taken that most people who are successful business owners, and in that I would include freelancers, are willing, would rather work harder for themselves than less hard for someone else. That is certainly true of me. So how did I get going? Well, <laughs> back in 2002, I had two things, a baby and a master's degree in French that I didn't really know what to do with. I mean, I know what to do with the baby. <laughs> and she's now taller than I am and 18 and a half years old. Um, but I didn't really know what to do with my master's degree in French. I wanted to find a job where I could work from home, um, at least when my daughter was little, and use my French. And so I decided to try translation. The first year that I was in business, I applied to over 400 translation companies. So this is what I mean by working hard over a long period of time. Even applying to 400 translation agencies, it still took about a year and a half until I was making a full-time income. So the first thing when beginning translators come to me and say like, I'm so discouraged, I've applied to 25 agencies and I don't have much work yet, that I, that's the example that I give them. I applied to 400 translation agencies and it still took a, a year and a half to make a full-time income. And I did a lot of things wrong <laughs> when I was a freelancer, like really honestly, the whole reason that I wrote my book initially for freelance translators is because there were so few resources at that time on the business side of freelancing. But one thing I think that I did really well was every minute that I didn't have paying work, I marketed or I worked on business development. I worked on my LinkedIn page, website, you know, so social media didn't exist <laughs> at that time. That's how long I've been freelancing. There was no social media. But the point being, um, so when my daughter was a baby, my goal was to work about two hours a day. So like 15 hours a week, two to three hours a day. And if I only had one hour of paying work, which happened quite a bit, then I marketed for 14 hours. That's how much I marketed. My first year, I made 9,000 US dollars and I was so excited about that $9,000 because my biggest fear was I would make nothing, right? I'd have no work at all. So if you work very hard for 18 years, here's what can happen. <laughs> Um, I work for mostly direct clients, which are, uh, I work for a few agencies, but mostly direct clients. And my primary specializations are international, international development. So I translate like for um, NGOs, non-governmental organizations that do work in Haiti and West Africa. I do a lot of corporate communications translation, and I also translate nonfiction books, and then obviously court and legal interpreting. Um, I make in a typical year 95 to 110,000 US dollars. And I say that um, like not to brag about, oh, I make so much money. Um, actually, when you pay self-employment tax on that in the US, it's a lot less than it seems. But also to say, I actually think that people who give other people freelance business advice should tell you how much money they make because you should know what that person's perspective is. Um, so I think that that's, you know, realistic for someone who works in the US and European markets, which you guys could too. It doesn't really matter where you live. It matters who you work for. 
Um, as I said, this year I'm doing a master's in conference interpreting and a typical work week for me is like 35 to 40 hours a week. Um, and I take about six weeks vacation, not so much now because there's nowhere to go, but um, I don't work crazy hours. Okay. Um, should you want to work for agencies, direct clients, or both? And we're going to look a little more in depth at both of those. So of course, the answer is it depends. Um, it depends on how confident you are in your translation and business skills. It depends on what specializations you do, how much money you want to make, and how good you are or how much you enjoy the non-translation parts of the job. So let's look a little more in depth here at agencies. So I don't think translation agencies are evil at all. In fact, I would love to find more translation agencies that would pay my rates. So just as an example, um, most of my translation agency clients pay 15 to 16 US cents per word for French to English. I have one agency client that I really like and I charge them 13 US cents per word. But the point being, because of that, I don't work for many agencies and I would like to. Um, and when I first started freelancing, those rates were pretty realistic for French to English and now there just aren't that many agencies that will pay or can pay those rates. But the thing that is really great about agencies is you should be able to just focus on the translation while the agency handles everything else. And one thing about agencies is that I actually think agencies themselves should sort of talk about more is they find the clients, <laughs> they find the work. Like finding direct clients is a lot of work and the agency does that for you. And in return, they're going to take a significant percentage of what the end client is paying. And I think like, don't get angry about that. Um, that's an agency's business model. And if that's not okay with you, then don't work for them. I'd say in general, most agencies probably take 40 to 60% of what the agency uh, or what the end client is paying. And then the translator or interpreter gets the other 40 to 60%. But if that's not okay with you, don't work with agencies. Um, I think it's just a reality that most agencies care more about price and deadlines than direct clients do. So I'd say I really don't experience in the direct client world that a direct client would try to negotiate over, let's say like one cent per word. Whereas agencies will often do that. And I think again, that's their business model. It's not a good thing or a bad thing. It just is what it is and you have to accept the positives of the agency world um, along with the negatives. Um, usually when you translate with agencies, you don't have any direct contact with the person who ordered the translation. And that can have its pluses and minuses. Sometimes that's kind of nice <laughs> that it's the project managers who have to deal with that. And sometimes it's hard because maybe you have questions that are difficult to get answered. So the other option would be direct clients, which means you are working directly with businesses, universities, um, individuals. I actually work with a lot of individuals. That's what I'm going to do today <laughs> after this um, webinar is over is translate a bunch of university transcripts for an individual. Direct clients generally pay more than agencies do. My direct clients pay 20 to 25 US cents or 18 euro cents ish a word. Um, but they I had to go find them. I have to retain them. I have to do a lot of work other than translate. Sometimes I have to hire an editor. One thing that I think is a big deal for some people, the second bullet point, direct clients often need specializations that agencies don't handle. So if you are that person, like for example, I don't think I could find enough work doing international development translation for agencies. I think it's just not really there. And if you are someone who wants to translate about musical instrument making, yoga, 
um, cross country ski racing, <laughs> you know, that could work in the direct client market because all you need is enough work for one person, but often not with agencies. So that can be a plus. They often need specializations that agencies don't handle. Of course, you have direct contact with them because there's nobody else there. But with direct clients, you're going to have to handle a lot of tasks other than the translation. Deciding how much to charge, getting paid, figuring out who's going to do the editing. Instead of you sending questions to a project manager, the client is going to send questions to you. It's going to be the reverse. And I think you have to find them and market to them. Um, like it's, I'm going to show you on uh, the next um, slide. It's really easy to find agencies to apply to. You could do that, you know, after this session today. It's a lot harder to figure out with direct clients who needs you and how do you find them and how do you contact them. So if you'd like to work with uh, agencies, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about sources of direct clients, but for agencies, um, the three places I would try are translation association directories. Uh, so, you know, most countries have a national translators association and you could look at agencies that are members of that association. When I first started translating, really the way I found the bulk of my initial agency clients was through my local association. So I'm a member of Colorado Translators Association. So it's the Translators Association for my state. And um, really how I found most of my, so my agency clients was I contacted all the agencies that were members of Colorado Translators Association and I asked if I could do an informational interview with them. So I went in person. It was a lot of work. <laughs> I went in person to those agencies' offices um, and did a little interview with them, even if they said that they didn't think that they would need me. It was a huge source of work for me. Then the two other places that I would recommend. So one thing, if you look in association directories, is you don't know a lot about that agency's quality. And there's good agencies and bad agencies. So two places that I would recommend, and these aren't like affiliate deals. I don't get any money from them is a website called Payment Practices, or if you are a member of Pros, um, pros.com, so for anyone who hasn't heard of it, pros.com is a huge um, job board and information site for freelance translators, and I don't find it that great a source of work, but it's a really good source of information. They have a, a similar thing called the Blue Board, which is where translators can review and rate agencies that they have worked for. And I don't think that I would buy the pros paying membership just to get the Blue Board. But if you have the pros paying membership anyway, I think the Blue Board is a really good resource. And before you start applying to agencies, I think at the minimum, you need a resume or CV that is targeted to translation and you need some sort of cover letter. Although these days, of course, that would be either an email or just something you paste into an online form. So he, I don't have a membership to the pros blue board, so I couldn't show you that, but here's what payment practices looks like. So on the top line, um, so the thing I really like payment practices for actually is research purposes. So one thing, if I wanted to find out the reputation of an agency I'm thinking about working for, I could just type their name where it says agency and then read reviews by other translators. But what I find it actually the most helpful for, and a membership to payment practices is like 20 US dollars a year. It's not super expensive. So where you see those two lines called PPR and TA, PPR is payment practices reliability. So that means, you know, did the agency pay what they said they were going to? And did they pay on time? And then TA is translator approval, meaning what do other translators say, do other translators say they'd be likely to work with that agency again? So one thing that you can do is just pick a country. So like I pick Chile 
and I didn't actually do the search. I don't know if you, I don't know what you'd come up with for Chile. <laughs> I just set this up so I could photograph it for you guys, screenshot it for you guys. So what I would recommend is just pick a country and then set your PPR and TA scores to 4.0. So the highest is 5.0. You can see that I um, set those to 4.0. And then it will show you all the agencies in that country that are rated 4.0 or higher by other translators. And I actually think that's an outstanding marketing tool. And like if you did that for the US, you'd get several hundred agencies. I have no idea how many you'd get for Chile, but if you did that for the US or the UK or any other, you know, major country with a lot of translation activity, you get several hundred agencies that are highly rated by other translators and then you know something about them. To apply to agencies is quite simple. I'm not saying that getting work from agencies is simple, but it's real they're very easy to apply to. Basically, and I'm going to show you this, show you an example on the next slide, go to their website. <laughs> so you find the agency's names in a directory or on payment practices or on pros or another translator tells you they like this agency. Go to the agency's website and then you're going to look for a link that says something like freelancers, join the team, work with us. Then you fill out their application and just be prepared that a lot of agencies are going to ask you for a lot of it's going to be a lot of work before you are accepted to work with them. So for example, a lot of agencies will require an unpaid test translation or they'll require you to give references. Now for me personally, like when I first started freelancing, I just applied to agencies like left and right. And I put a lot of time into agency applications that never resulted in any work because I didn't have any work. I didn't really have a choice. At this phase of my career, I don't do an agency's application process without asking them two things. So for example, I would not take a test and I would not give them references unless they answer two questions. Are my rates acceptable to you? So I would just say to a prospective agency, you know, I charge 15 to 16 US cents per word. Is that in your budget for French to English translation? And do you need or anticipate that you will need additional French to English translators because I don't want to go through your process just to be added to your general pool of translators. I want to go through your process only if you think you might start sending me work right away. Now, when I was a beginner, I couldn't do that. I didn't have that luxury, right? I just had to apply to any agency that was interested in me, but now I wouldn't do that. So here's the kind of thing that you're looking for. I just screenshotted a couple agency websites here. So see on the top one, it says join our team and on the bottom says job openings. And so those are the kinds of things that you are looking for. And then there will be a online application or some smaller agencies just have an email address and say like, send us your CV or resume um, to this email address. Now, if you want to find direct clients, there are a few ways that you can do it. Um, so as I said, it generally is more time consuming, but where I would start is kind of like the equivalent of a translators association. Every profession on earth, every industry on earth has a professional association. So a really good source of where to find direct clients to market to would be a professional association for their sector. So pharmaceuticals, immigration law, international development, they all have professional associations and that saves you from just Googling like, you know, pharmaceutical company, Germany. <laughs> You, know, you can look for, for example, a European association for pharmaceutical companies, and there are some, I guarantee you. Another place would be international chambers of commerce. So for example, here in the US, we have like a French American chamber of commerce, a German American chamber of commerce that indicates that those businesses do business between the two countries. LinkedIn is like a gold mine of information on direct clients. 
So if you have an entity that you would love to work for, like let's say for me in international development, if I wanted to work for like Doctors Without Borders, I go on LinkedIn and type Doctors Without Borders in the search bar and it will, LinkedIn's um, indexing system is really, really good. I don't love everything about LinkedIn, but LinkedIn's indexing system is really, really good. And it will show you every person on LinkedIn who has the words Doctors Without Borders in their profile. It'll show you if Doctors Without Borders has a content page on LinkedIn that you could follow, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I find LinkedIn really, really, really helpful for direct client research. And then also the business news. So for example, one thing I would do if I were you guys in Latin America, let's say if you translate between English and Spanish, look at the business news for your country and see what um, international companies are setting up new offices or hiring people in your country because then you know that they might need a translator so let's say that you see that a you know british pharmaceutical company is setting up a branch office in ecuador or they're going to run a clinical trial in ecuador that means that they need an English to Spanish translator because all their stuff is in English. I think the business news could be a really good source of um, contacts for that. And then how do you contact them? So a bunch of ways. Um, the number one marketing method I use for direct clients is just plain old email. <laughs> it's boring, but it works. So what I would do, let's take that pharmaceutical company example. Um, I don't do pharmaceuticals at all and I don't live in Ecuador, but let's use that example. What I would do is go on LinkedIn and see if I can find someone who works in an appropriate position in that pharmaceutical company. So someone like um, Latin America manager international clinical trials manager, international communications manager, international marketing director. And then it's not that hard to find people's individual email addresses. So sometimes it's on their company website or sometimes you can use, and I won't go into this too much, but you can find them specialized search tools online. And the one I use, actually, let me switch over to the chat. Hopefully nothing bad will happen here. So the tool that I use, I just typed it in the chat, is called hunter.io. I won't explain in depth what it is, but point being, it's not that tough to find people's personal email addresses. And I'm going to show you on the next slide an example of the kind of email I would send, but I just send them an email. You could also send paper letters in the mail. I've actually had pretty good success with that. One thing I would definitely recommend is attending their conferences, especially now that you don't have to travel. So I will tell you guys that um, students in my marketing to direct clients classes who have had a huge leap in their direct client businesses, like I have two students that I can think of at least, who went from no direct client work to more work than they could handle in one year. That sounds like a crazy advertisement, but it's true. In one year by attending client conferences. So for example, one of them is a French to English medical translator and she went to medical conferences in France. So pretty much she's the only translator there. A lot of those companies translate into English and she had really like more work than she could handle within a year. And I would particularly take advantage of that option now that you don't have to travel because I think for a lot of people that's the huge barrier is traveling. LinkedIn, we already talked about, network other translators write articles and things like that, that they might be interested in and might contact you about. And then advertising, I'm not crazy about advertising, but for example, um, on specialized websites, like if there's a specialized website for your target industry, I think that could work. So when I talked about um, email that I would send, here's an example of what I would say. 
As a French to English translator specializing in the development sector, I recently came across your website while researching NGOs working in Senegal. I can imagine that there might be a need for a French to English translator to support your products. Would you be the correct person to speak with about offering my freelance services? So I could send this to them via email if I can hunt down their email address, or I could send this on LinkedIn. Um, a couple of options there. And honestly, I think that this is a pretty successful marketing technique if you send a lot. I would estimate that to find one new client, you're going to be sending probably a hundred at least emails like this because a lot of people just aren't going to um, respond. But I have pretty good luck with this, um, with this type of marketing because it's fast and easy and I can just do it when I have like 10 minutes. Um, a few resources that I would recommend if you guys are interested in marketing and just Google these and you'll find everything you need to know. <laughs> There's a guy in the US named Ed Gandia that if you haven't heard of him, you should definitely follow him. He does a blog and a podcast for freelance writers but really most of it is applicable to translators too. And he is sort of the guru of this method called warm email prospecting, which is exactly what I just showed you, where you're sending emails to people you don't know, um, but you're doing it in a targeted way, not like, dear sir, could you use a Spanish translator? So I love Ed Gandia, check out his stuff. Then um, some of you guys may know a US-based Swedish translator named Tess Witte, and she has a fantastic blog and podcast called Marketing Tips for Translators, and there's years and years of content on there, more than enough <laughs> podcasts to keep you busy during all of your exercise and driving for now in the next couple of years. And then I'll also take the liberty of recommending my blog, which is at trainingfortranslators.com. Um, I've been doing it since uh, 2008. Ah, yikes. And there's like 800 posts on there. So I think some of those might be helpful too. Okay, moving on, we're going to talk about specializations and then uh, do a little wrap up and then I'll take your questions. So are specializations necessary? It kind of depends on your language. Like if you are a Norwegian translator translating for agencies, you're probably not going to be that specialized. But in if you do Spanish, if you work with direct clients, you have to have a specialization because that's how you narrow down and find the higher paying clients. Agencies generally want these like big broad specializations. So most translators who translate for agencies are going to say, I do legal, financial, IT, patents, medical, um, a pretty big specialization. Whereas direct clients, nothing is too narrow. So for example, the story I told you about my student who went to the medical conferences in France, the only thing she translates for direct clients is information related to orthopedic implant devices. So for example, artificial hips, artificial knees, or you know, if you like crush your finger and you have to get your finger joint replaced, she all she translates about is orthopedic implants. Other translators I know work for, right, the chemical coatings industry, private investigators, content marketing, annual reports, nothing really is too narrow. Um, where can your clients be? <laughs> Anywhere, especially now. <laughs> I have a lot of translation clients that I've never met in person. And especially these days, really now even for interpreting, your clients can be anywhere. So I know um, a number of interpreters based in the US who are now working pretty close, time, close to full time for clients in Europe and they just work on European hours. I mean, it's kind of awful for your personal life <laughs> because you have to be online starting at like three o'clock and you know, they work like three o'clock in the morning until noon or something like that. But the reality is, especially now your clients could be anywhere. One thing I think you just have to be realistic about is if you do English into Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, probably other languages, you just have to be realistic about the income potential in your own country. Now that isn't true of everyone, 
but for example, when I asked Greek, I put that in there too, because here's an example I can give you. I was talking to a Greek translator who I know, who I had the impression that she works for pretty high paying clients and makes a pretty good income. And I asked her, how many clients do you have in, she does English into Greek. Um, how many clients do you have in Greece? And she just laughed and said, none. <laughs> There wouldn't be any clients in Greece that would pay my rates. And so she works for like American technology companies that translate into Greek. So I don't mean that at all to be negative. I just think it's important if you do a language where there's a lot of downward price pressure that you can work for clients anywhere, but you have to be realistic about, you know, what is the income potential for the English to Spanish market like in Mexico? I'm sure that there are some high paying clients there, but the bulk of your clients may be out outside your own country. Okay, let's just wrap up here with a couple pitfalls and best practices, and then we'll go to your questions. Um, I think the number one, hands down, by far, can I emphasize that enough, pitfall is, and this is beginning and experienced translators alike, expecting too much return from too little marketing effort. Being that person who says, I applied to 25 agencies and I don't have much work yet, maybe this isn't going to work out, or I'm so discouraged. I think point two, if you are a beginning freelancer, you need to expect that it'll take you at least a year until you have full-time work. Now that's not always true. I'd say a couple highly specialized translators I know we're doing pretty well within three months. Like people who had, let's say, a background in a scientific career, um, legal, medical, uh, financial, people like that. I've heard people who were pretty much up and running in three months. But other than that, I'd say at least a year where you are basically marketing more than you're working. People whose language skills just aren't good enough. And to, um, you know, not to make fun of my own country people, but for example, I think in the US, if you just went through the US educational system and you never lived in your non-English language country, it's certainly possible that your language skills aren't good enough to be a translator. And then not knowing your limits, taking on work that's way too technical, you know, like you're a beginning translator and an agency offers you a, you know, aircraft engine manual and you think, okay, I better take it because I need the money. Bad idea. <laughs> know your own limits. I still do that. I turn down lots of work that's too technical because I don't do technical stuff really at all. And then on a more positive note, <laughs> best practices. Um, as a, Can I say this enough? Every second that you don't have paying work, you need to be marketing or working on your business in some way. When you don't have work, that doesn't mean time off. It doesn't mean that you get to just like go running and play with the dog. It means you need to be marketing. I think personal connections are really important. One thing, this is a little harder now that a lot of people aren't in the office and you have to get their mailing address. One thing I did when I applied to agencies was anyone who responded, I sent them a handwritten card with one of my business cards in it. So I sent them a handwritten card and just said, you know, thanks so much for uh, responding to my inquiry about French to English translation opportunities with your agency. I look forward to hopefully working together in the near future. And I think that made a big difference. And then this one is, I think, really important both for beginners and experienced translators, maybe more actually for experienced translators actively seek out work that you enjoy and are good at. Don't just translate whatever lands in the inbox. And the thing I will tell you from teaching translation business classes for a long time, like nine, more than 90% of translators are just translating what lands in the inbox. They're not going out and looking for work that they enjoy and are good at. And if you do that, you're gonna do better than the vast majority of translators. Okay, that's pretty much it. So we're going to give you some information about um, signing up for the paid version of the course if you would like to. Um, it's Renato, maybe I'll turn that over to you, but I'll tell you guys, it's four sessions that are two hours long. It's $88. Renato is giving you an incredible deal. And, and by the way, like I get paid the same no matter how many people sign up. So I'm not trying to make more money for myself. 
not by telling you to sign up for the paid version of the course. I'm just telling you that by the standards of the translation industry, it's a really, really amazing deal if you'd like to get some quality training at a really good price. And I'll tell you, like, the quality level of Renato's stuff, um, he was telling me that he had a consecutive interpreting or interpreting note taking training with Andy Gillies. Andy Gillies is like a huge, huge name. He teaches in my master's in conference interpreting program, and he wrote like the textbook on note taking for consecutive interpreting. So take advantage of whether or not you want to sign up for my paid class, take advantage of the stuff that Renato has to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Karine, for invitation. Well, as, as she said, we are going to answer the, the question that we have in the chat. But we wanted to present you this uh, training that we have uh, prepared for you. It will be held on March. You can see the dates there will be full uh, language, uh, full, will be full English language. So you have to be um, fluent uh, in English to participate. It will last eight hours and will be divided in four sessions of two hours each. Okay, you will receive a certificate at the end of the program and it will be on a private platform like this. Uh, the sessions that we have planned are this one's launching your freelance business, marketing your freelance services, setting up your office and your business, and rates, contracts, and terms of service. I would like, uh, Corinne, if you can give us a brief uh, description of the sessions so you, we can go to the, the, quest, the answering questions. Yeah, sure. So as Renato said, we're going to do four sessions. So it, um, it goes Friday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday um, on two different weekends in March. So the first one, we're going to talk about launching your freelance business. That can be, I think, both exciting and nerve wracking. So we're going to talk about how to set up your startup phase um, for success. And that's for people with little to no freelance experience. Of course, anybody's welcome to come, but the material is for beginning freelancers. Um, next, we're going to talk about your office setup. So physically, how to office, how to set up your office, how to set up your computer, what software tools you need to work successfully as a translator and also um, things that you may want to think about outsourcing, like um, accounting, web design, stuff like that. So uh, uh, sort of running an efficient business. The third session, we're going to talk all about marketing. Um, so you know whether you want to do agencies or direct clients, clients can't hire you if they don't know about you. And we're going to focus on how to create a marketing plan and how to set some realistic marketing goals for you. And then the last session, we're going to talk about rates, contracts, and terms of service. So deciding how much to charge, how to set up a contract um, with a client, and how to look, evaluate contracts that you might get, for example, from an agency. So that's it. And then you get a certificate at the end of the course. It's eight hours um, in English with me, and it'll be on a similar platform to this. And the whole thing is eighty dollars, so not per session. Eighty dollars for the eighty U.S. dollars mm -hmm. um, for the four sessions. Yes, yes, you can sign up on the. There's our website. You can sign up and pay directly from that link. I will send you information and the um, email when we end this session with the recording access and also if you're interested on in participating on this training in March. So. Um, Corinne, let's go to the question. We have a lot of questions, and let's see if we can answer them all. Let's um, see. <laughs> well, seven minutes. Questions. Let's do it. <laughs> yes, some of them have to do with the uh, how detailed the the curriculum have to be. How much information do I have to put on my curriculum to call the attention of agencies or or clients? Mm -hmm. So on your resume, CV, different countries, call it different things, just the document you're going to send to an agency. So I would say for a American or European agency, and Renato, maybe you want to say for Latin America, because I don't have any Latin American clients, so maybe you want to give that perspective after I do, one to two pages and if it's two pages, make sure that all of the important information is on the first page. And more than that, write a summary. So 
you know, you have, I think it's good to put a picture. That's a personal decision. That's something that's kind of changed in the US and European market over the years. I like putting a picture. So for example, on mine, there would be my picture, my contact information, my title, French to English translator, specializing in international development, corporate communications, nonfiction books, French to English interpreter. And then right below that, I have a short paragraph that is sort of like um, the text that you would put on your website homepage or your LinkedIn about session. So mine would say something like, um, you know, French to English translator and interpreter, 18 years experience as a freelancer, then my specializations. Because if people only read one thing, you want them to read that. And then I'd say for the US or European market, typically you would put um, your freelance translation or interpreting experience. If you don't have any, put your language related experience. Like if you've been a language teacher, if you've been a you know bilingual journalist, things like that. Um, then you'd put, and I like to put some sample projects to give an agency an idea of what I do. Um, you want to put your uh, education and then some people put testimonials. So a quote from a client that says like, you know, working with Renato was such a pleasure. We had a large rush project and he met the deadline and our end client was extremely happy with the results. But I think for the US or European market, keep it short, one to two pages, one page is better. If you really can't fit one page, make sure the, inf the important stuff is on the first page and always, always, always have a native speaker proofread it. So for example, if you're in Latin America and you're doing it in English and you're a native Spanish speaker, it, the best would be to have a native English speaker translate it, but at least have a native English speaker proofread it. So I don't know, Renato, do you want to say for Latin America sort of what the convention might be? Yes, I would say the same one page. At least we as an LSP receive a lot of uh, CVs every day. <laughs> Uh, of course, and we pay attention to experience, of course, education and references. We pay a lot of, uh, we mm -hmm. love when they have references on the CV because, because we call those references to oh. see how was the work with them. Yes, I would oh, say that this cool. three points and was just, uh, just one page uh, of CVs enough for us to, to uh, at least select that people, that uh, translator and set up uh, an interview of course, and we call the references. Cool, good to know. Well, the, the, the other question is regarding um, who you contact uh, within the agency, who you contact uh, with, with your find for um, direct clients. Who is the, the one in charge? Is the, is the marketing one? Is Yeah, so my, take with most direct clients would be who you don't want to contact is human resources because they don't know what to do with freelancers and the executive level people because they don't have time. So the thing I always tell people is if you, if you can't figure out who might hire a translator, like who might be in charge of translation. I mean, if you get lucky, like the other day, I was doing an example for one of my classes. And when I put that company's name into LinkedIn, one of the people it showed was their translation coordinator. <laughs> like, you know, ding, ding, ding. You know, that's, that's sort of the dream scenario, but that doesn't happen that often. So I think the best is if you can find the kind of person who might need you. So for example, for me, if it's a French to English international development client, what I want is someone whose title is like um, West Africa program manager, Haiti program manager, because I know they deal with French. If you can't find that, I think someone in marketing or communications is j simply the most likely to respond because it's their whole job to communicate about this company. So, you know, if you are applying to, let's say, a big immigration law firm, the best would be to find the immigration lawyer who deals with your languages, you know, the person who handles like Latin American immigration cases if you do Spanish. But if you can't find them, I think the marketing or communications person, they probably don't hire the translators, but in my experience, they're the most likely to write back. 
Corinne? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and what do you recommend for asking for feedback to clients? Uh, or... Ooh, that's a big one. I mean, mm -hmm. so I'd be interested to hear what you have to say too, Renato. I think the important thing is to tell clients that you're open to their feedback even if it's negative or constructive. So one thing that I tell every client, agency or direct client is, your, I wanna have a long-term relationship with you and your feedback is really important to me. So even if you have negative feedback or there's something you think I could do better, I wanna hear that. You're not gonna hurt my feelings, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. I'm here to serve you. And so I want you to tell me that, but I think the hard part is um, realistically, and I think understandably, sometimes agencies don't wanna do that because they think the translator is gonna get really mad and argue with them. Um, so I also think it's important to understand that if an agency just stops working with you again and doesn't tell you why, that's their, that's up to them. That's okay. <laughs> they're, they're not, like I think a lot of people, if they fail a translation test, they get really angry that the agency won't give them detailed feedback. And honestly, I understand why agencies don't want to do that because they think like, I don't want this translator like sending me hate mail and telling me that I'm wrong. So I think be open to it, but also recognize that some clients won't give negative feedback. They'll just stop working with you and that's their decision. I don't know. What do you think Renato from the agency? Uh, we, well, the, the PM, our PM is the one that had to deal with those things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, he has to be, uh, he has a lot of patience, but we... <laughs> he must be very him. diplomatic. Yes, he is. And what we had as a protocol is to provide feedback to our, to our translators. We have a small group of translators we, wo we work with. And we are constantly giving feedback to them since mm -hmm. it's a small group of people that we are uh, always working with them. Uh, mm -hmm. When we have to hire more people for bigger, bigger projects, uh, it's kind of, it's more difficult because it's people you don't know, you don't have the confidence to, to give feedback that sometimes is no. Yeah? And they start um, saying, no, you're not wrong, I'm right. And you don't right. have to go in that discussion, right? You just want to make sure that your client is uh, getting what he wants. Okay, but I would say that the feedback is important and your openness to receive it as a freelance mm -hmm. is important for the agencies too. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the PM says, I don't want to, I don't know how to say this to her. She's a good translator, but I, I don't want to hurt her feelings. But she had know? a bad day. She was tired. She was maybe, rushing. Like, maybe, is, well, but, but the, the, they say like, this isn't this person's usual level of quality. Something must have been happening. Absolutely. And, and the openness of the freelance is important mm -hmm. to create that, that link. Big time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think a couple of more. There, we have a lot of questions, Karina. I don't think that we can cover them all. Okay, but um, but I, I, at the end, I would say, what are your suggestions for people that is just graduating and want to start a, a freelance uh, a freelance business, creating a website, uh, uh, getting a specialization for from online courses like Coursera, edX? What do you think about about those courses, for example? Mm -hmm. I love Coursera. So um, here, if any of you guys have never heard about it, I'll type it in the chat. Let's see, Coursera. There we go. Um, so Coursera, is, I think that that's an outstanding way to develop a specialization if you have the discipline to follow through on the you know self-paced online courses. The thing that's amazing about Coursera is it's really high level university professors that teach the classes. So I think the quality is much higher than a lot of, you know, your average online course. Um, and it's free or close to it. You know, their courses are either free or maybe it's like 20 US dollars, but you have to have the discipline to follow through on it when no one's like keeping track of what you're doing. And I just think as a beginner, you have to be creative and you have to be a really hard worker. Um, so I'll give you an example. So I had a um, student in my class for beginning translators who lived here in Colorado and he was English into Spanish, which you think is, you know, one of the language combinations where it can be harder to find, you know, clients, good clients, because there are so many people doing it. 
So he came up with this idea that the city of Denver, which is the capital of Colorado, they have all these tours of Denver. I mean, not now, but this was before the pandemic where you walk around with a guide and learn about like the historic buildings. And he said they should have those tours in Spanish. So he just called up, I mean, he's obviously very outgoing, <laughs> but he just called up the Denver, you know, tourism or visitors board and said, you know, you guys need to have these tours in Spanish. There's tons of Spanish speaking tourists who come to Colorado and they said yes. So I just think as a beginner, you have to be creative, you have to work really hard and you have to put time into things that might not work out, you know, like doing interviews with agencies just to find out what do they need? What are their, you know, growth areas? If you were to pursue a specialization that's very in demand, what do they think? What would they recommend for you? So, and I think, um, yes, definitely a website or a really good LinkedIn page. Website is the best. Um, but if you really don't think that you can manage putting up a website right now, at least have a really good LinkedIn page, because if clients can't find you, they can't hire you, especially for people where the high paying clients are probably not where you live. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, it is better to set a high rate at the beginning and then negotiate or start with <laughs> low rates. What do you think about it for beginners? <laughs> well, I think from my point of view, that is harder to increase your rates later that you, you should start with high rates but it's my opinion i don't know what you think uh, totally a hundred i uh, agree with you a hundred percent like it's always easier to negotiate down than up you know and i think once you've established a rate with a client it's extremely hard if not impossible to raise it significantly i mean maybe a little bit but i think um one thing that i do when i market to direct clients and they ask how much i charge is I always leave a little bit of flexibility if I really want to work with them. So for example, I might say something like, my usual rate is 20 to 25 US cents per word, but if that's not in your budget, let me know and we could talk about it further. So I'm not saying I'll give you a discount, you know, and I would always also try to negotiate something other than money. Like to say, you know, could you give a longer deadline? Could you, you know, could someone at your office handle the formatting? Like I try to negotiate on things other than money, but I totally agree with you, Renato. Much, much easier to negotiate down than up. <laughs> Absolutely. And the last one that I think that had to do with the, the business part of, of our job. Uh, do you use accounting or customer relations software or how do you manage those relationships? Oh, I'm pretty low tech because I hate accounting. So I just make my accountant do everything. To tell you the truth, I just use Excel. Um, and then I send all the Excel files to my accountant. So a couple of things that you might wanna check out is there, and I'll put them in the chat here. There's two programs just for our industry. One's called lsp.expert and one's called Translation Office 3000. And if you're starting from zero and you want some sort of customer relations management and accounting tool, I think those are pretty good. I mean, the sort of standard accounting software in the US is QuickBooks, which a lot of people use. But to be honest, I hate accounting so much <laughs> that, um, that I would rather just use um, spreadsheets and then pay uh, my um, pay my accountant to do it. And I saw Kiara just asked, do I share my rate with direct clients or give them a quote for the translation? Never be the first one to name a price. Always wait until that. Like I never would give my rates in an initial um, email. I always wait for them to ask and then give them a quote on a specific project. Great. Great. I think that uh, we cannot read all the questions. I will try to get in <laughs> touch with everyone okay. to answer some of them. Sure. Also, but I, I just want to thank you, Corinne, for today's session. Also, oh, thanks. thanks everyone for participating, everyone uh, who's watching the, the recording also. Uh, and uh, well, you know how to find uh, the registration for the March training and wait for the links to access the recording uh, at the end of this session. Thank you very much, Corinne. Great. And that thank was you, really everyone. fun. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.